Hi everyone, welcome to Brown History Podcast. This is episode 12. I'm really excited about this episode because today our guest is going to be Dr. Suraj Yangde. He is the author of the bestseller book, Caste Matters. He grew up in the slums of India as what is considered a Dalit, and he hustled his way up. And now he has a high position in Harvard University. He's considered India's one of India's leading scholars and public intellectuals. The book is amazing. It's not only just a good read, but it's also a very important one. This episode is going to be amazing. It's an eye-opener, at least for me. We talk about Dalit literature, we talk about the Dalit Panther Party, we talk about history, we talk about him and his life. Also, if you love the podcast and you really want to support, check out patreon.com slash brownhistory. Do what you can, it goes a long way and it really does help. Thank you so much. Here we go. So that you can get some elevation. It right now looks it's, like... It's not, it's not going to be visually recorded, it's going to be recorded audio-wise. Yeah, for me also it was easy. So oh, okay, I, don't, okay. I don't have to look down on you. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I read your book. You did. Thank yes. you. Very good. Man, you've been you've been prepared. I like I, that. <laughs> you're a professor. I gotta. It's like back to school. <laughs> I watched your, I watched your videos too online. Um, Okay, so first thing when I was reading this book, it's, it's incredible that there's not enough books on this kind of topic. I grew up in Canada, so my school curriculum was pretty much American history, especially American racism, black history. And this is like, like an extreme version because what I don't understand is that it's, at least with black racism, there's a visual difference. And, and pretty much any racism I've ever learned you know, uh, World War II, uh, German Nazis, there's always this, vi- there's this difference. That's right. Where you have a language, religion, and skin color. But That's here, right. it's insane because there is no difference. Yeah. <laughs> so how does that work? I think that's a, that's a good question to <clears throat> kind of investigate actually. Uh, and also kind of complicity, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, is it recording? Yes. Oh, okay. So we, we are, we are, we are into it. Yeah. Yeah. We were into it. But I'll, I'll, if you don't, yeah. Uh, I guess first thing I got to say is that if I say anything offensive or inappropriate, I apologize in advance. Uh, I'm not, I have no idea what the right things to say are and whatnot. It's not a topic that people discuss here often. So yeah. So what I wanted to know was more about you. So I guess we can go back to the beginning to where your dad and your mom and where you grew up, your dad himself, I had a tough time in, uh, in Indian society. Right. No, I appreciate you uh, uh, kind of giving those caveats uh, uh, for and for your sensitivity. <clears throat> Is this okay or do you want me to get the earphone like I'm, I'm, I'm okay. It's up to you. Yeah. So if this is fine, I'm fine with it. As okay. long as Whatever you're off. comfortable with. No, I mean, I just wanted to, because it's audio, I just wanted to check what is comfortable for you. Okay. You look comfortable uh, with those Christmas pajamas on. Yeah, you know, I just got it secondhand, five or ten dollars, something like that. <laughs> and they're gonna last longer. Yeah. Maybe if you meet next Christmas, you're gonna be seeing me in the same. Well, you're in quarantine, so you can wear that, you know, forever now. Like this is <laughs> it. <true> <laughs> this is the new. This is the new cool. <laughs> you know. Also, I ca- I come from a family where frugality was prioritized because you don't have enough, so. Uh, you know how to make most of it, you know, and I and I still remember wearing clothes uh, whose original color was something else, and by the time it retired, uh, the fabric had given all its originality and come up to something else, you know. <laughs> and it's it was it's, it's very it's very peculiar mm-hmm. to <clears throat> excuse me revisit some of those fading of colors as you fade the time and your resources are also then, you know, kind of replicating how you make most of it until, and you know, of course there was this kind of creating a patch, (laughs) you know, wherever clothes are. Uh, And so one day I just bought a new fashionable t-shirt, which was made up of patch. My mom got pissed because, because that's representation of poverty. Like, you know, you don't have much, but that's a style now, you know, you, when you patch something, if it's like Like ripped jeans and patches and ripped shirts. (laughs) She didn't like that. She was like, I, you, you, you wear this as a fashion, but you know, I have to do that because, you know, there's no other, you know, clothes that you know, I, we can afford new. So I guess that's how poverty works. 
Yeah, but uh, you were you you grew up not just in poverty, but I didn't even know there was something called a uh, BPL. People, I didn't even know there was a thing like that. How how poor is BPL? I think the the the, the characterization of BPL, you see, it depends of how much money, uh, you know, one 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 does make. But there is a figure that I'm just looking at, which which basically uh, you know keeps. Which is which is measured according to how 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 big is your household, how much is the income, what kind yeah. of house, what kind of roof you have. Is it made from tin shades or is it made from CC RCC? Uh, is it made from a different kind of uh, a material? Uh, or much of the time, corrugated roof or something of that sort. And then how many members you have? It is it is a very peculiar metric that Indian government uses because uh, the poverty indicator that we have that can be measured in global standards uh, uh, doesn't adequately apply to India because there are people much, much, because uh, non-ownership of resources uh, plus non-source uh, of regular income is in certain bracket, mm -hmm. so right up there. And, uh, <clears throat> and because my dad was the only one who was working, but he stopped working because he was not well with rheumatoid arthritis on his knees and his joints. Uh, so uh, we basically had no income. My uncles, both sides, uh, mother side mama, and uh, father side chacha, uh, they both uh, brought us up in mm -hmm. a literal sense. Like they would only, they would sponsor the education, they would give money and stuff like that. And I think my mom kind of was the hustler in game. She kind of got her brothers to you know. Uh, and in 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 India, if you know, or even in our cultures where we are from. The brother sister relationship is quite intimate, you know, it's like more, more sacred than, you know, and so if you are a sister, and if you ask a brother, it, it, it yeah. is, the, the brother has to follow the call of a sister, it's, 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 so she, she made most of her sisterness <laughs> into the relationships of her other brothers and uh, um, that's how, uh, that's how it was. Uh, uh, and the below poverty category is as it says below the poverty line that we are used to, <clears throat> and I think uh, you know the, the the number keeps on uh, the number keeps on uh, changing, uh, but uh, the measurement is and and, and you know, I was for this book I did research on World Bank and to kind of look at and, and surprisingly my district called Nanded, which is in uh, Maharashtra province, but it's almost like center part of India, small mm -hmm. town, about small town, 3 million population, uh, not town, but like a district area. Toronto is uh, 2 million. Say what now? Toronto is 2 million. <laughs> that, there we go. And mine is small town district. Um, uh, so, you know, the, that category itself uh, depends on if you have a fridge, if you have color TV, uh, if you have a means of transportation, if you have a access to safe drinking water, uh, what is the education level in your house? Uh, what is the sanitation? Then um, in addition to that, it goes to if you have, if you own land or if you have access to other resources such as employment and other means. So there are these metrics. And in all of this, we didn't qualify. <laughs> wow. we, had, we had no color TV, we had no fridge. I, I bought fridge uh, three years ago, uh, uh, now three years ago. We didn't have fridge. So my mom would preserve the food under the matka. What's hoping, a matka? Matka is a earthen pot. I've seen it in and, the Hollywood movies. <laughs> so uh, we we had we had that, uh, and so underneath there was a little bit of whatever cold space. And so usually what would happen is uh, the food would usually go stale because you know you need a proper temperature. And and so I don't even now I don't know how to use the fridge because I'm just not born into the culture. And so whenever I cook food, I cook only for that night without thinking food can be preserved. And sometimes it just happens with me. I make only enough that maybe it will last until next day. But when I see my friends and all, you know, they cook like a proper portions for at least lasting. Right. So I'm still, you know, <clears throat> that's crazy. Exactly. What was the education level in your household from your mom so and your dad? The highest was ninth grade. My dad was ninth grade. Right. But he was pretty, he's a very smart guy. Yeah, he was. A, so my mom is seventh grade and dad is a ninth grade. Um, but he was very much uh, involved in, uh, you know, literature and activists. You know, he was part of Dalit Panthers movement. That's Dalit Panthers. Can you tell us more about that? 
Yeah, so Dalit Panthers was was a movement started by urban youth in mostly Bombay and Pune region of India, Western Maharashtra, Western India. And uh, that was inspired uh, partly from Black Panthers because yeah. activism was already existing. Uh, uh, early 1970s, when the atrocities against Dalits were on rise, uh, they decided to, uh, you know, especially a government committee uh, kind of gave an evidence that, you know, the rising atrocities with atrocious numbers and Dalit women rape were increasing. And so it was a militant response, but primarily to it being a military, it was a literary response. It was a gathering of poets, uh, writers uh, who articulated their anguish and communicated to the world. And as you know, uh, theory is then followed by action. Yeah. So many people, uh, especially within the dominant caste, circles, uh, they always undermine Dalit intellect and Dalit intelligence, and they always uh, replicate the European form of socialist model to think that Dalits don't have theory. Like Marxist movement always has a theory and followed by action, and they say Dalits need more theory. I partly agree. That's my criticism, basically. But also, much of Dalit action is predicated on theory. You don't look at it as a theory. So this Dalit literature and Dalit uh, response uh, through writing uh, Dalit theater, uh, Dalit music, Dalit poetry, these form just galvanized. And, uh, and then we have the super articulate smart people uh, who then, you know, <clears throat> came together and, and, and formed uh, what we had, Dalit Panther. It lasted for five years and then it was disbanded. Uh, by the leadership, but uh, it continued. So Dalit Panther never died. It, it's it's like people then, when it was the quote unquote original was disbanded, but there were other state in Gujarat. Uh, there was Dalit Panther in Gujarat. Then there was Dalit Sangar Samiti, almost kind of partly inspired there in Karnataka, south of uh, India. And then of course in, in Delhi and Uttar Pradesh as well, the Dalit Panthers were existing and then Bihar also took off. So what I mean is like there was influences Mm -hmm. That kind of, as, as you know, branches. Uh, yes, and India, it's it's a federal. I mean, it's 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 almost a nation within nations, uh, uh, and and so within the uh, each state, uh, each language produced literature, each language produced response, and that was phenomenal, because these are people essentially who are working class laborers. They are people who are agricultural laborers. Mm -hmm. These are people who don't have resources. If you and much of them wrote autobiographies. And these autobiographies are source of inspiration. I think any person who needs motivation in their life, who need source of energy and purpose should read the lit literature, should read the lit autobiographies, because in each story you will see literally uh, how uh, condition was used and subverted by the people who were conditioned into that condition. And to simply put it, uh, the structure that made them Dalits and made them resourceless, disempowered, uh, <clears throat> put them at the receiving end of violence, uh, atrocities of uh, any form, psychic, physical, but also economic uh, uh, lack of uh, economic access and employment that kind of followed on. These people used that condition, subverted it, and, and really built upon that. So misery, pain was used as a currency to challenge the norms because you see, uh, uh, the emotion of tear is very powerful. If somebody cries, uh, your humanity is kicked, at least for the time being, you become concerned. Mm -hmm. And, and, and Dalit uh, literature not only just cried, but it followed with an action. It called for destruction of Brahminism. It called for uh, elimination of patriarchy. Uh, it called for uh, uh, total uh, uh, annihilation of landlordism or feudalism that was caste inspired. And then of course, uh, the Dalit Panther imagine a future of a global universalist solidarity. Not all of it could be implemented in the lifetime, but they created an archive for someone like me to build upon. So my father was very close to the founders. So actually my original name is not Suraj. My what name is, is Su Rade. It's a Marathi, a uh, highbrow Marathi. And it's it, and obviously I'll explain what that means. Rade is heart in Marathi, heart, heart. and Su is kind. 
Surade, kind-hearted. <laughs> that was the uh, that was the name, but not many people could pronounce. And as a kid, I felt, you know, if if nobody if somebody mispronounces your name in the class, you feel you take it like personal upon you. Yeah, you, yeah. you kind of uh, especially if what, you're already an outsider. I'm most definitely, and you know, I was you know I was more insecure. I didn't wear nice clothes uh, to the school uniform, and uh, not always, you know, the best. You know, it it had to be the same. So all kinds of thing kind of build upon. And so, but the founder of the Lit Panther, one of the founders named me after my father, you know, named me that gave me that name. Uh, and, um, and then of course the other, other Dalit Panthers who are alive and one of the co-founder, uh, JV Pawar, who's still alive, um, uh, you know, now, uh, he went, my dad. So I would, as a child would go and meet them, uh, in, in Bombay, which is 12 wow. hour train ride from, for me. So in a way, that's how my dad was, but more importantly, my dad was a cultural political activist. You know, he started theater in my hometown, which was anti-caste theater, progressive theater, kind of getting together. And then of course, help support uh, formed uh, local groups that promoted, you know, art based activism. Uh, and his more intention was art literature. And because even he was ninth grade, he would read all of this, you know, Leo Tolstoy, Albert Einstein, you know, <clears throat> Kanchi Ram uh, and Ambedkar, uh, and and he knew about the black struggle also because you know that's how you are kind of, and fortunately Marathi literature provided that base. So he was Marathi guy. So that was the uh, that was the kind of base where uh, the concrete was still a bit mushy for a rose to uh, rise. That environment instilled kind of a. Uh a drive for you to take action and kind of like, you know, fight back. Did you, did you kind of, did you know you were already kind of an outsider in the society or did it come to you kind of, did your like parents kind of explain to you the context of where you're living and what your situation is, or did you kind of just face it and figure it out on your own? See both ways, right? Parents see, um, I mean, now I'm appreciating uh, when I'm getting more older that parents always have, the fear for their kids. Sometimes yeah. it's irrational fear, but that's just a parental fear. <laughs> you know, they're just extra cautious about the kids. And, and so um, I grew up in a slum. So, you know, I mean, there is no caste in the slum <laughs> because you're all belong to the same caste. I grew up in a Dalit slum. So everybody was from belong to my caste <clears throat> and they were also sub caste distinctions. And uh, my dad started a movement to, eliminate subcaste discriminations. Uh, he would, the, the, he started a, with, a, with a movement called Maitri mission. Maitri is friendship, friendship mission. And under that he started Port Jati Todo Samaj Jodo. Port Jati Subcaste. Break the subcaste, Port Jati Todo. So he wanted Samaj, solidarity between. Yeah, between the, so, yeah, exactly. Subcaste as yes. one, so united yes. more strength. Yes. So because Dalit is not one caste, they are close to now 1246 subcastes within wow. Dalits. That's exactly. Um, and, but not only Dalit, the, the funny fact is people only focus on Dalits. Every caste Brahmins have, now I'm, I'm just cataloging so far. I've, I've managed to reach, uh, uh, 600 and something, but there are more mm -hmm. castes. So each group has caste, subcaste and sub subcastes. Um, so bringing this perspective into focus was not their intention, but that is how you grew up surrounding. And you are way early. Like somebody, may, somebody asked me this question. When was the first time you realized Dalit? <laughs> I'm like, when was the first time you realized you were a female? You know, it's, 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 it's like, I, I, I know the question where it is coming from. It's coming from total uh, uh, space of ignorance. Uh, but it's 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 not a question that a person in my position can afford to, you know, live without. You know what I mean? Yeah. And 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 I think I've I've thought about it. I, I you know I, I went into my memory lane and where where was the moment? And I, and, I, and I was like you know must be early on. Who knows? There is no one particular moment which I can describe as oh that made me feel uh, <clears throat> that I was a Dalit because being Dalit or having a response to Dalit. Is not one response. It's not a response of rejection, celebration, fighting, 
it is all of that you know it's different sometimes you appreciate yourself like we grew up appreciating ourselves our culture our music um it provided it was a very rough environment it was all working class mm-hmm. and that's only below below poverty line uh, survive, and survive 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 just survive you you slog during these were basically people who worked as masons who who worked on construction sites yeah uh, who worked in kitchen as Labor the kitchen jobs. staff you know the hot hotel kitchen job yeah. and then some were uh, would go and work in uh, uh, the service industry like uh, uh, pro- providing being the butlers um, not even butlers the deputy of butlers um, or uh, b- making the shoes you know in yeah. factory factory production and do you would know these people because when you would they come from work in the evening you know thakke aa gaye and and what do you do in the evening is they all would come together at the nukkad and they would just would like to you know smoke or eat tobacco and talk about you know not relevant stuff just to get rid of all the, and you would smell because each would carry a significant smell of that industry and uh, then of course you know that's how that was the you, i didn't realize this as much but i only kind of started appreciating this in hindsight you know and then and then you pick up those tiny uh, lessons that you get how does how does caste survive come as a in a um, from a lens of capitalism cuz i know now there's traces of uh, caste system in america especially i remember i remember reading an article a long time ago about how caste is in uh, silicon valley in california in cisco so i was wondering how that kind of how would you look at it from a capitalist point of view you know see slavery is a modern form of a uh, capitalist enterprise yeah that's that's kind of was in many ways gave a foundation to western capitalism uh, the transition that took from feudalism to industrialism that was the point when marx was writing as well and frederick engels was also describing that situation so capitalism has a stage that kind of you know goes through uh, and compared to slavery uh, we have had slavery for legitimate 2300 years it was it was endorsed by manusmriti which was law of the land uh, for so many years and i think <clears throat> that a peculiar aspect of course it was not continuous there were moments of frictions in between but but the but the lifeline of it was straight it it remained it remained stagnant and in in that context uh, how do we describe capitalism in an era when capitalism cannot be described uh, in concrete terms uh, what i mean by that is how do we uh, infer a capitalist uh, response to the caste system and i think one of the ways to do that is to understand india uh, although people like to call it capitalist and it is in a way neoliberal more sense but it's still feudalist society because it's still living in feudalism era and feudalism is nothing but casteism it's just a the feudalism is the name of a western order uh, in in oh. a more in, in a more indic sense yes i understand you have to see exactly and and so the relations that we have you know uh, and and so uh, you know in in our in our in our come back to returning to the history of the of the space of the south asia we have to look at how were this relation managed and how were they uh, maintained for so long um, and and then you might realize there is something more peculiar than feudalism because feudalism at least had an order yeah where the peasants we were working for aristocratic elite here there were multiple castes working for and they were doing it out of the religious necessity that they were forced into and and so uh, they couldn't do anything else but serve the landlord and we didn't had the same strict hierarchies because the aristocrat was aristocrat yes but also there were deputies of aristocrats which were belong to different castes so aristocrat had a caste and the deputies of aristocrat had a caste and the workers or what we call peasants had a caste so when we import western definitions to understand indian society we miss out the most essential experience of india's uh, description of history which is relating to how caste gives rise to all forms of oppressive uh, mechanisms and and i think that people have not done it because the people who interpreted history of india especially through capitalist lens were belonging to the oppressor caste they are the descendants of aristocrats they are the descendants of the kings of the monarchs or the people who are land owning elites so why would they identify themselves as oppressors so by making it a peasant category or making it a category of a feudal 
what we do is we 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 uh, we uh, emasculate a certain uh, a notion which is very much a broader notion but feudalism is not one entity it's multiple entities it's multiple caste and in every state there is a different way of looking at it and so for example in pakistan the likes of nawaz sharif for example himself a, a, a khatri caste old owning a huge swath of swath of land so what we see is that then uh, even in our critique of nationalism or critique of capitalism we brush in a very broad stroke uh, the other forms of original oppressive dynamics which are still relevant yeah. and by not calling it what it is what we do is we make the project a lengthier one we make it a project of emancipation uh, much slower and much duller if you will that's crazy uh wow uh i didn't even think of that way but that just blew my mind um how is how is caste different in the powers is the same thing because i i, I from my my understanding the power is still kind of going through this kind of uh, uh, hardship but maybe maybe a bit harder or maybe they're there's they're behind a bit to india you know it's so i had the good fortune to visit nepal uh, last I watched year that video yeah and and that was one of you know uh, i learned a lot and i'm grateful to my comrades and colleagues who invited me there um and you know one of the uh, peculiar aspect of nepal i at least observed was nepal, nepal was at least a little bit of liberal society compared to india uh, it it was open and it was willing to engage at least but again then as i discover there is a difference between the people who are on the south of nepal and other people who occupy the mountainous region and there are various caste structures uh, maintained um in that way the nepalese caste system uh is as intense as we can see and notice and you know they recently had like protest and there's a caste based violence um and and there is a kind of reckoning but nepal itself also in many ways especially the ruling class sees themselves as the junior indians or the junior brahmins if you will you know and 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 to that effect by by promulgating brahmanism they have really uh you know undermined uh the other kind of anti caste discourse and and one in- interesting thing that happened in nepal is the rise of the left the especially maoist party uh within and you know, which which was in government of course ruled by brahmin so the the funny fact is the oppressor is brahmin and the liberator is also brahmin now you figure out where do you fit in that and so within within that uh, political dynamics uh they i think is the only country which has acknowledged to the un about existence of caste no other country in the world has acknowledged so in that sense at least i give it to the nepali uh civil society as well as the government and so uh, and, and 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 non civil society spaces uh which have at least created a space of dialogue and kind of working working through working through the structure and and nothing that's why we need to look at when we look at caste we just don't have to pay attention to india but we have to pay attention to south asia then be it pakistan uh, you know be it uh, nepal be it sri lanka but also other kind of regions i don't know much about bhutan uh, but you know there are various ways and of, of course afghanistan also features very much uh, into the paradox of caste is just that after it became islamized uh, it in a way got uh, in a relative sense liberated from it but it inherited the caste dynamics as and when we they change the religion how how pa- how pakistan and the bura caste system even though it's a muslim society see that's the unfortunate part right because islam should have i mean see many people voluntarily converted especially from the lower castes yeah uh, to islam you know and some was of course also forcible conversion and i think it happens everywhere uh, where a, a ruling class will 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 ask its you know subjects to 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 do that um, and so the conversion took two play two ways one is of course the conversion by force and conversion by voluntary you know and the voluntary conversion that took place was to was to say to the hindu brahmanic system that we don't want to live under the brahmanic hegemonic caste system because we right. are the lower subjects and islam immediately was a panacea because you can go and pray in the same mosque you know uh, and and you know uh, at, in front of the god allah you are all everybody same you are his you know uh, he, you are equal to, in, in his eyes and so even that was not given to lower caste people you couldn't go into temples even now there are venues in india 
uh, as we speak, are not allowed. And so that disbelief and this offering of Islam to you know being equal and you know sharing of resources and you know, the kind of big brotherhood that convinced. But along with that, the people who were owning land and resources also got converted because uh, they also wanted to maintain their control. So if, if, if I want to work well with a new government, I will change my ideology. In this case, they, they change not only ideology, but also their religion, because in, 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 in earlier times, ideology meant religion, you know. And so when you converted, uh, you maintained your control. And that's the history. Like Brahmins never lost their absolute control on India's or, or rather South Asia's dominion because they co-opted with every ruler. So when the Mughals came, the, the one of the first people to work with them uh, once they established were the Brahmins and Rajputs because they realized, you know, if we don't, if we don't fight, because see, the caste system only gives right for one group to fight. Other groups are, are without uh, weapons to fight. The reason India was colonized so many times is because of the incompetence of the people of the dominant caste. Only they had the power to fight. Whereas the lower caste, the, the peasants, the people working in the farm, who are actually warriors, you know, they were, they were weaponless. And, 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 and the reason they were disarmed was because the fear of the ruling elite, that if you want to control them, if you, if you empower them with the weapon, the first thing they will do is they will slit our throats. So they they, at the cost of not giving up caste-based hierarchy, the dominant elites, the Rajputs and the Brahmins welcomed the colonizers from other parts of South Asia just to maintain caste. And that's why India had a repeat of Mongols, uh, Mughals, Turks, uh, Portuguese, the British. French, British, colonization you're saying you're saying that i need to reread history again but in the context of caste now because... it is all about caste my friend okay that's crazy uh how's, how did the british affect caste british saw a loophole <laughs> and any administrator who wants to colonize and rule would find it and use it for their benefit and the funny thing is who were the informants of british brahmins bingo because the people, the if you if if you are into if if you are into a new space and new terrain, you have no idea, absolutely no idea of what the geography is and the complexity of South Asia is such that I mean you would know that you know language changes almost every twenty kilometers, right? Uh, the yes. food taste changes. It's not possible to rule this entire you know, and by the way, British technically, since the Queen's Proclamation, rule ninety years. 90 years? Yes, with like British rule. Yeah. If you count East India Company, then it becomes 190 or so. Yeah. Not more than that. Right. We invest so much time in 200 years. But we don't give we paid we don't pay attention to pre 200 years of oppression. Why? Because the elites were displaced by British. And that's why they have scorn. <laughs> but before British Whenever a new ruler came, the ruler was there to profit. Colonization's rule has always been exploitation of the working class and labor. Yes. Resources. And so as long as they, they got taxes, they were fine. But the people who were mediators, the people who were informants, the people who dealt as the native officers of the colonial regime, they sold out the country. They sold out my ancestors. They sold out my relatives and the vast of India's poor, lower caste, working class people, which are by the majority of India's population. Just to maintain caste system, the ruling class was willing to let go of India's control to a foreigner. And then they requested the British to get position in jobs, get uh, um, you know, uh, favorable uh, contracts. And that's why you will see a friend of mine just did a thesis where she she went and saw her own uh, family how she, how her family benefited from colonization <laughs> and 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 you know and her, her i think her one of her relatives not immediate grandfather but somebody in the relation was working in one of the uh, extractive industries as a bureaucrat 
and and how they made up like when during you know when this was happening he took major land for himself and that's why you know land issue is such a contentious issue because uh, the the very essential aspect of your survival in agrarian economy is land and how you control your cultivation and production this was all given to the profligacy of dominant castes the brahmin and allied caste so they could uh, maintain their hegemony and the lower caste remain lower and that's that's why that's how we have to calculate the measurement of colonization so when we look at capitalism that's how we have to look at as to how do we measure the oppression of so many years and who is accountable to it and the ruling class have their uh, hands uh, soaked in blood not one generation but several generations and several times not just one time and same happened with the with the with the muslim elites because muslim elites were themselves benefiting out of caste system um and 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 one of the charge against muslim rulers is if you were really convinced about uh, islamic brotherhood and and in the message of allah you should have eradicated caste system it wouldn't take much for a ruler to pass a, a rule to say no untouchability from now onwards or no caste system that didn't happen effectively right no. after 700 years of approximate rule we still have caste system alive who is responsible for that and 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 i think caste system is not like it's not like they didn't rule whole india they ruled only part of india and part of india was not but that's not the point caste is everywhere where you ruled or where you did not rule so there was something uh, very equivalent that the brahmins made a pact that we will let you rule but you'll have to let us live the way we are living with our own customs and traditions and for a islamic ruler <laughs> you, you you are anyway polytheist you are you are heathens <laughs> so you do you as long as this is this is this is benefiting and you know that's why you will see uh, there is a stage there are various phases uh, you know where a slave could become a king especially the the delhi sultanate uh, you know was known as slave dynasty uh, but a dalit couldn't become a king that's the peculiarity you have to understand a black african could become the the shah mm mm-hmm. you know the bacha but a dalit who is a native blood who is living there for several thousand years cannot ascend to even to a second position let alone become the bacha wow how what about what about when the british were colonizing india and then they would take uh, indentured laborers to africa to uh, jamaica all around the world did cast you know come board on the ships to the specific mm-hmm. places or did it kind of disappear when it was on the in the ocean that 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 merits two responses okay one is obviously and two how did cast how did how did cast got dissolved because there is a very interesting study in this case where cast becomes obfuscated by the time you reach to a new destination and i think diaspora literature has not paid attention to this very unfortunately the prime reason of indenture especially again this was voluntary as well and of course sometimes it was coercive yeah but who volunteered to leave this place oh dalits why would they leave better better they were suffering in india so if you are going to a very indenture and, and indenture stories are not stories of lofty or or good life it's a story of pain anguish lot of suffering it's not that but they were willing to and you know Africa was known as a land of animals animals will eat you there was all kinds of stories and basically there was a rule in the brahmanic hindu literature which said you cannot cross the seven seas it's a sin oh ka- kalapani kalapani so that was there for that was made for dalits not to leave because if they come oh or, or rather any caste rather any caste any any anybody anybody could uh, Uh, not leave because you know you you cannot cross over the dominion because if you cross then they say you will lose religion and the lesser like really oh let me get first on this bus now because that's what they were looking for and not only the lets but majority of them were uh, the lower caste people the ones who belong to shudras uh, and so uh, and because of the sheer number uh, they got into the uh, onto the bus uh, sorry onto the uh, sh- uh, of course bus and then ship because not all of them came from the port towns uh, and and i think uh, we we see the uh, we see the transition of of such 
uh, you know, movements and, and many a times much of the indentured labor didn't come from coast, but they come, came from mainland. And so, for example, Mauritius, majority of them are Hindi speaking, mostly from UP and Bihar. And I was recently talking to, uh, recent in COVID times is four months ago, uh, I was talking to somebody uh, who actually talked about how caste operated in uh, Mauritius as to how the, you know, still the relations are, are maintained. So when, when people went on, you know, it's, it's the same story here again, like earlier, and it's a written record, especially when Brahmins are dealing with British or even pre-British colonizers, uh, they are asking to maintain, you know, they are, they are, they are saying under the name of religion. You know, like you are Christians, you are Muslims, we are Hindus, we want to maintain our religion. Please allow to maintain our religion. What does that mean? That means is please don't mess up with the caste system we have created because we want to continue to having our own hegemonic position and we want to continue to exploit the lower working class because we still have control. Even though you are a badshah in your own right, but also we are our badshahs because there are other people who worship us or other people who are lower than us. Mm -hmm. Similar kind of replication model was existing in indenture kind of phase where here, funny enough, the uh, the people who recruited, they were called agents uh, who recruited people for indenture. Uh, they were given a strict order. Don't hire upper caste people, mostly Brahmins. And and, and this dominant caste space uh, was, was rejected because they said they whine a lot and they complain a lot and they work little. So they are not useful for us. The because they want the upper caste. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and the reason was they wanted to have the separate treatment. They wanted to have separate kind of food. They say, we don't mix with these people. And the guy who's, who's, who's your, who's your Sardar or who is controlling you on the farmland, you're working basically as a slave. You don't get all those facilities. Yeah. And so they were like, we don't want this. So it's, it's very interesting how colonization and Brahminism destroyed the most are the lower caste people or the Dalits in particular. Who, who is to you, how, what, what role did Dr. B.R. Amidkar play for you? And can you explain who he is? I mean, I know uh, I've read about him, but I just want you to say who he is. Yeah, I think. Because uh, I grew up, I grew up learning about Gandhi and Muhammad Ali yeah. now, but this figure was never really talked about or shown in like Bollywood movies, where, which is where I'm most, I got most of my history from. And now, he's becoming a lot more popular and it's crazy that this person doesn't give the attention, doesn't get the attention he deserves. See, Ambedkar is the, is the hope of India's future. Uh, not only because he is smart and intelligent, but also he is soothsayer. He is describing how the country is going to look like. And you better work with the person who's looking at future than the person who's dwelling in the past. Ambedkar is a philosopher of the past condition so he can write a better future. And he wrote uh, the testament of how our collective uh, future is going to look like. And when I say India, I also include Pakistan because I'm talking about pre-partition India. And in, in, in this case, you can see Ambedkar is not only reforming the age old malice. See, in one life, if you have managed to change, you have really achieved much. And the people who have done that in their own lifetime are people like Nanak, uh, who established Sikh religion, but also it took few other, uh, almost the 10 gurus to establish a Sikh order. Uh, and so uh, in, in that sense, Ambedkar's presence is very vital uh, to the health of democracy. Uh, he is a radical social democrat who believes uh, in the uh, struggle of poor people across caste. But his focus is to empower the people who have been disempowered uh, for more than two millennia. And it is in this context, if we describe heroes and sheroes of our struggle, we should describe the people who have made good in the life of the people who had no hopes, not good in the life of those people who are already uh, living with more than what they need. Uh, the likes of Gandhi and Jinnah fall into that. Jinnah are not much as much as Gandhi uh, and both belong to the same caste, just different religion. And it's, it's very interesting uh, that how uh, ethno-nationalism mo mostly and also then uh, a theocracy 
uh, spoils you know the the base in this case so sanam bedkar kind of challenges all of this he is he is heterodox uh, he is not a person that can be fit into one frame and that's why uh, people have difficulties acknowledging him he's not marxist you know he's not your easy lefty he's not your neoliberal he's not your capitalist uh, he's he's not a person who you can easily um, bake into a binary or any category he's someone who deals with humanistic aspects and human condition is evolving condition mm-hmm. you cannot utilize a fixated ideology to work with a human mind because that human mind is changing and ambedkar was an activist of a human mind he worked with this evolutionary aspects and that's why he was known as pragmatist who worked with whatever means and measures he had and mind you he is the only dalit who is that much educated in the entire world <laughs> at least the one we know and he is written india's constitution uh, his uh, um, his contribution uh, to the theories of india's history uh, as well as india's anthropology are one of the most uh, important uh, monumental texts uh, written ever uh, not only for his intellectual contribution but is also the political activist who enfranchised uh, the otherwise segregated and and oppressed population that was not considered politically mobile enough he may, he gave the most powerful weapon in the hands of untouchables or the unseeables he made them politically potent he gave them vote and in democracy he made them immediately equal no raja ka bachcha no bashah ka bachcha you are all equal in a democracy and i think in 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 that light ambedkar is really a hope for the world simply because when we think about subaltern nationalism when we think about uh, the emergence of uh, lower classes oppressed people black people these are the people who are trying to find avenues of freedom who are trying to find new ways to gesture new values because the values that we have been working with so far are are inadequate gandhism literally in many ways is not adequate to our times what's wrong because, with gandhi's philosophy yes what's wrong with his philosophy uh it's not nothing wrong with this philosophy it's like, just the time is, has changed it's not what's missing because see so far people celebrated gandhi yeah or gina yeah and yet the problem remained and almost in a similar sense vocabulary also has not changed so something peculiar is happening here as well and that peculiar is that the rebellious aspect of changing the structure totally not changing eventually people right now are hungry right now yeah they want bread right now they don't want lofty words or an ideal to think with that can go along with what ambedkar does it ambedkar provides two way one provides an immediate action and as well as a spiritual guidance which we need which a person in a situation of a uh, 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 conditioned depression needs both of that it, it's 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 not a therapy lesson that he needs to uh, or she needs to work with we need a programmatic response and i think the more people are recognizing ambedkar's contribution to not only challenge the existing structure but also the contemporary uh, problems many of the people romanticize the past in a way so as to not leave a gap to critique it ambedkar was open to both and and in in this times what we see is people are still protesting in pakistan still protesting in nepal still prote- you know and, and and of course it's a virtue of democracy people protest but they are not protesting for new thing they are protesting for same old thing and this is where ambedkar would come and say exactly so now how do we do let's redistribute the resources that will be his first thing let no let there be no monopoly of capitalism then he would he would ask for redistribution of important resources you would talk about education you would talk about how to uh, strengthen more representative democracy and what we have today is we don't have representative democracy we have a plutocracy we have people of a certain class representing or pretending to represent that's not going to be possible ambedkar believes if you come from that calm you should represent that calm no one else should represent you mm-hmm. because that's that's not how democracy works and operates in this case if you are belonging to a certain constituency of certain group certain identity you should be represented by that person and i think 
people need that. People need to be seen represented. People, that's why we have all this diversity and equity movement in Western metropole. That's basically Ambedkar's formula of proportional representation. He's asking for representation of, you know, and he gave that in way back in 1931, you know? Yeah. And so right now we are coming to terms with it. So what I'm saying is the ideas he proposed as a solution to a problem. And as I said, he's looking at past and that's why that's where he's drawing his lessons from. We have very few thinkers who have managed to do that. Many of them were just willing to acquire power. And they thought acquiring power will then give them opportunity to think. Many of them didn't realize getting into power will itself make you old. And by the time you're trying to think through it, you already have to think about next election cycle or, or the next agenda. There is a certain a leisure for you to be not in politics and do this. Ambedkar was in politics, but it still did it. And I am still in amazed. Why did he do that? He wrote India's constitution. Um, his books are now in 24 volumes thick books, I wrote almost in every aspect of Buddhism, Islam, Jainism, religion aspect, talked about uh, uh, the political democracy, his text, Pakistan or Partition of India, is probably, you know, when his book, that book was read Muslim League, every leader read that book and debated that book as to, is it really a good idea? And, and the contemplation kind of taking place. Uh, and in many ways, uh, Ambedkar is also a philosopher of Pakistan as a political idea. Did did Ahmed Gur convert to Buddhism, or did he get? Did he try to, or and not Buddhism in a sense like a monk, but but in a different sense, right? From what yeah, he did. Does, yeah, he did. Does, did did caste system kind of go into Buddhism too, or did that did Buddhism kind of took that away? So the only religion that took most like powerfully relative to other religion was Buddhism. Uh, because it, it it left no gap for <laughs> uh, any hierarchy of, uh, you know, Mullah Malvi or Brahmin priest or something. Right. Uh, it, 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 it was pretty much on three. One is Buddha is your teacher. Uh, second is the Dhamma, which is the, the discourse that Buddha teaches, which is basically a basic precepts of life. And third is Sangha. Sangha is not one. It's a communion. Uh, so these three describe and define him, uh, Buddhism. Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. So, because there is no, and, and anybody can become Buddha, anybody can become part of Sangha. There is no, but that's not applicable in other, you know, you really need to be, you know, you can't be, you have to be the child and child of child of child of Muhammad, or you have to be relative of X, Y, X, Y, Z, and you know, yeah, that doesn't work. Buddha really removed that. He said, you are a human being and you are capable of becoming the Buddha. And that's what more appealing. And, and so he converted en masse. Um, one of the, I think the, the largest conversion in one day ever happened in the world uh, where people, so many people converted at the same time. And, and that repeated several, several, over several weeks. And even now, <laughs> uh, the most active, one of the most active movement in India is conversion to Buddhism because people leave uh, Brahminism, the Hinduism or any other religion and convert to uh, Buddhism. When I when I googled the lit, and I went on the news section, murder, murder, rape, murder, rape, rape, murder, rape, murder, like nonstop. Pakistan, India, Nepal. It just it just, it was it was depressing. How how do you have hope? You know, because you're a very driven guy. You you're you went to Harvard. You did something that where people from from where you come from, it's very rare to where you've achieved. You know, so where is your, do you, I mean, do you have hope? Are you optimistic? Well, I'm still at Harvard and it's, and it's a great place and it gives me more hope. Uh, although it's quite snowy <laughs> outside. Um, you know, it's, um, it's, 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 a, it's a question that requires deep meditation as to, you know, the, the initially what you pointed out as to, is there a hope to, uh, you know, this condition when you see all of this. You know, it's unfortunate that caste, caste-based violence has also migrated to other parts of the world. Uh, in Canada, in fact, recently in on the West Coast, uh, I heard a case where I, you know, I had to speak with uh, one of the, uh, you know, case laws that was happening. They wanted my expert advice about a caste discrimination, caste-based violence. You know, wow. Uh, and and believe me, people are 
this is coming to four because people are openly discussing about it. Not that it is only happening now. That was what happened in Cisco and other places. And so that is a sad thing to learn, but also that's a good thing to know that people are fighting back. People are asserting themselves. The more we assert, the more response we're going to get. But that's the always the first response. That's a immediately knee jerk reaction. If I come and call you out something, you're going to respond to me. But this is a process. As I said, uh, the first response that we are saying when we are asserting ourselves, they are, they, are, they are outrightly discriminating or they are denying discrimination as existed. But I think the second response might not be as intense. People might acknowledge. And that's the kind of hope where I see where, uh, you know, more people are getting aware of it. And one of the things we need to do is we need to make ourselves responsible for our complicity in this. Uh, if we are of the South Asian brown background, uh, we need to understand where our location is. We can't play uh, innocence on an atrocity and murder of a community. We can't say, I didn't know that. That, that basically is perpetuation of a crime uh, that you want to wash your hands away. Uh, when uh, Khandil Baloch case happens, happens in Pakistan, yeah. it is the caste case, but we don't acknowledge it as a caste case. We acknowledge it as a case of obscenity and, and, and other uh, where the similar Religion. response are not Islam. religion, of course, of Extremism. course, Christian, Christianity and, and how it kind of uh, 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 places itself. So I think it's all upon our society. And, and believe me, talk to your parents, they will know about Zat. They will know what Zat is, you know, although they might say they know I'm not expert, but one need not be expert. It's just an experience. And how do you exercise it? What is Zat? Zat is caste. Zat That's is how... caste in Urdu. Yes. Okay. Or also in, in Sikh, the, the, the language Punjabi and, you know, with the various ways in Marathi also, it's a native term. It's interesting how it kind of relates to that vernacular. And, and I think in, in, in that possibility, what we need to do is to recognize that not only black lives matter, but also lives of other oppressed caste people, the Dalits also do matter in this. We can't have a privileged form of activism by only claiming our victimhood. Although yes, we are victim, but also our position victimizes someone else. The very reason we don't have many Dalit voices, Dalit discourses, when Dalits are 300 million total, and we have absolute, almost non-existent space. Much of our Bollywood, much of our social culture is dominated by dominant caste culture, their food practices, their religion. By doing that, they colonize much of it and undermine much of my religion my practices, my ancestors. And so for a hope to come, I would also would like to see a more hopeful response from dominant caste who are willing to be vulnerable, willing to stand or be put in on a pedestal of self-reflection, very much a Socratic method. So we can then uh, transcend to a level of, you know, developing more empathy or else it will just be a elite caste, elite class, discourse of our culture, which will again degrade uh, our intelligence and coming generations. Uh, this is probably one of the most eye-opening episodes I've ever done. If someone wants to read about the literature, this is probably my last question now. If somebody wants to read about the literature and wants to get more information about this, is there any books you recommend? to the Oh, yeah. Thing? So, you know, um, so uh, I've written an article for a magazine, Caravan, on what books to be read. Um, uh, it's just that the, you know, some of the, uh, fa fa the, the members of the magazine, their parents are sick. So it's taking time, but the article is going to be out hopefully inshallah next month where you guys can, uh, then, you know, have a look at that list, produce the list. Are you Muslim? Uh, no. Okay. You said inshallah. That's we use always like in our, because, uh, we, uh, like I grew up in, um, so my region was dominated by a Muslim. So we were never colonized by Britain. We had a dominion of Nizam of Hyderabad right, under right. that. Um, and I think Inshallah has become more secular than one would think these days. <laughs> true, true. The French, the French use it quite often when they don't like the Muslim woman's clothes, uh, but they like this. <laughs> okay. So your magazine comes out. Uh, your article comes out next month and they can they can uh read it there and you, you have can you just name one book out of it 
Oh yeah. Like, um, you know, how about I, how about how about I just uh, list out those names for y'all? So maybe your uh, just, just one or two books that you think is a good like intro, like to get into it. Oh wow. Um, read Cast Matters. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you now. See, one thing, one book you could definitely read is uh, read a book called Jhutan uh, by Om Prakash Valmiki. It's translated in English. Amazing literature. Jhutar. J- Jhutan. J H O O T A N. Okay. Jhutan. Maybe we can, you know, in your um, podcast, we can give this list so resources for people to. Yeah. Uh, and in in the web, and then Ambedkar's Annihilation of Caste. Okay. That's powerful a- text. Yeah. And uh, then uh, obviously uh, read uh, Baburo Bagul's When I Hid My Caste. He talks about his experiences of caste and, and dealing with it. And then there is an amazing book by Bama uh, in Tamil, but it's translated in English called Kuruku, uh, Kuruku and that's also an amazing book. And so uh, there is more list, more in the list coming. Uh, that's, so- that's more than enough, I think. <laughs> that's it. Any, do you want to add anything? You want to talk about something before we say the end? No, I just, I just loved as I'm talking to you. No, it was man. a very, very good uh, uh, Christmas morning to start <laughs> with. You know what I mean? Uh, like uh, the, the sun is a little bit out and uh, I thank you for your work and your contribution to the community at large. No, this and was an I- honor. This was amazing. This was really, I have to reread. You understand now that I have to go back and reread everything I've learned in, in the cask perspective now because this is crazy this is you know like someone tells you something and you're like whoa i have to start over this is like that so i i now i feel bad because whatever whatever i've been doing is wrong because there's like a new ingredient to it now and i'm so glad i was able to uh, encourage wow. you to do that <laughs> <laughs> all right man thank you so much uh i'm probably gonna post this up in a week compliments of the day to you and uh, hopefully for your listeners and everybody, 2020 was as usual not very good for us, but 2021 is always with the hope. So Inshallah. In a hope. Inshallah. In <laughs> All right. Take care. Take care, Hassan. Adios. Bye bye.